So I've been thinking a lot about isometric art recently. After creating a small game for a game jam entry that utilized an isometric perspective, I've been thinking a lot more about how to implement it in a larger project. For the past couple of months, I've been working on a deck building roguelike game and the art so far has felt a little stale. So I decided to implement an isometric art style which came with a lot of complications and a lot of benefits which I'd like to discuss in this video. So what this video is going to bring together is first, a high level overview of why someone would want to use an isometric perspective, then an explanation on how to create tileable isometric pixel art, a discussion of the math involved and the utility of linear algebra, and an overview of the code changes I had to make. Previously, the game utilized a top-down perspective, which you might see in Pokemon Diamond or Stardew Valley, where the camera was only rotated on a single axis, similar to looking down at a chessboard. Now, imagine looking down at that chessboard, but rotating it 45 degrees on the vertical axis, and you'll see what it looks like from an isometric perspective. However, you can imagine this comes with a lot of complications, both for art and for code. Coordinates, for example, become very strange, and art becomes difficult to tile and very difficult to imagine. After all, rotation on a single axis is hard enough to picture, let alone on two. You'll see this style in Monument Valley and Enter the Breach, which my game has been particularly inspired by. So why would anyone use this style at all? It's used in engineering and architectural drawings as it permits a view of the three-dimensional structure of an object in a way that's impossible otherwise. It shows multiple faces at once, and I think this particular way of projection permits someone to create a more pronounced 3D effect than pretty much any other method using 2D sprites. I think it's a cool stylistic effect and really enhances the idea that you're working with and playing on a game board, adding another level of abstraction to the experience. I really like the idea of an indirect control of the game, where you're not really moving the character but rather applying some other separate abstracted input to move it separately. And it also solves to some degree the problem of sprites blocking each other when they're adjacent. Okay, so now speaking of sprites, how does one create pixel art, particularly that tiles uh, correctly in an isometric perspective? I'm going to show you how to do this on a 32x32 32 32 grid on a sprite, but you can use any resolution you want. So we're going to start by creating a new 32 by 32 uh, sprite, and I'll be using a sprite for this. We can turn on the symmetry mirroring options in order to expedite the process, and also I'm going to change the palette to rosy42 because I really like this palette. Um, now you can start by putting a single pixel at the top, uh, going one step down, and we're going to be holding down control and shift, um, and it will automatically create this pattern of going down two steps uh, two steps on the horizontal direction and for every one step on the vertical one. Um, now this ratio is essential to create isometric art, at least in this projection, um, and it creates in pixel art a perfect hexagon. Now in order to create the top face of this cube, uh, you can remove this horizontal symmetry and we're going to do the same thing here. Um, you want to start one step down as if this would be the top face and it's sort of just connected here um, And make sure it's symmetrical to the to the top that's actually there um, So we end with a section of two pixels um, a flat section of two pixels not of four Now we can shade in the square the outlines are sort of just to provide us an area to fill in conveniently and uh, the way I'm going to do this is I'm just going to fill those in by using the line tool. So again, you can hold down control and shift in order to fill, in order to use the line tool with the uh, brush selected. And we're just going to fill in uh, all of the areas that require um, an outline. Now, if we imagine the light coming from the left side, which I think is standard, uh, you can fill in this left side of the cube with a darker color and the right side with a lighter one. Okay, um, now in order to shade this, there are a couple of options. Uh, for texturing, you're kind of on your own here because I'm not so great at that. Um, but what I like to do for shading is just create a lower area that's a bit darker. Um, I'll copy this right side color onto the left side and then I'll 
make some vertical extrusions from the bottom just to create a nice shaded effect. Make sure the point where they meet in the middle has uh, switching colors, otherwise it'll look like it's blending weirdly. Now you can add all sorts of interesting um, additions to this, like adding, I don't know, floating dots, um, as well as like edge highlights, which you might find quite useful. This is the general procedure for making a tileable cube. Um, now, in order to prove it's tileable and you don't need to do this, I'd assume you would do this in whatever game engine you're using. Uh, what we can do is uh, scale everything up to a larger canvas and we'll duplicate this. So I'm going to create a new layer and I'll turn down its opacity. Then I'm just going to paste in this option and you'll see that it fits um, the edge sort of like a jigsaw piece. Um, now you have to do this exactly with the correct 2 to 1 um, horizontal to vertical ratio and you have to start with this 2 pixel segment at the top. And you'll see everything fits together perfectly and you need to have this specific configuration for everything to tile correctly otherwise it won't. Um, now the problem is that with edge highlights you'll see them overlapping on each other which is maybe not ideal. Um, so you may not want this edge highlight effect at all. Having it only appear on actual edges is a harder programming problem that is not going to be part of this tutorial. You also notice that we have weird um, aberrations here. It looks like it takes a step down um, at the intersections and really I don't think there's any way around this. Um, this is sort of due to the fact that we're not using exact 60 degree angles for our curves here, for our um, edges. Rather we're using approximations. Um, we're using a two to one pixel ratio. As we get to a higher and higher level of fidelity with higher resolutions, we'll see this effect of having, um, see we go from two, two to one um, to one to one, of, and so we end up seeing a vertical drop um, on both these sides. And if we apply an outline effect with uh, Shift O, uh, we'll see that we don't have an exact uh, exactly perfect ratio here. Um, but there's not too much that can be done about this, uh, and we can sort of just hide it by uh, applying other visual effects on top. So yeah, this is the general solution to creating uh, tileable pixel art, and of course it's not perfect, uh, but I'd say it's close enough that it's rather difficult to notice. One of the ways you could hide this is with a um, an edge effect to sort of just blur it in and remove um, remove these edge highlights, um, and that might be an option for you. We can have some edge shadow, um, and it might obscure the rather the uh, rather jarring drop here. But yeah, this is how you do the pixel art. All right, so. Regarding the math involved, playing with isometric coordinates really showed me the utility of matrices and linear algebra in video game programming. My previous experience with matrices has always been pretty abstract, and I think the example of isometric projections really shows you how matrices can be super useful. Specifically, I'm going to be talking about transformation matrices. Um, what they do is take a vector and map it between coordinate systems. If you're unfamiliar with vectors and matrices, you can think of a vector as a list of numbers and a matrix as a grid of numbers. They're pretty interesting mathematical objects that interact in unusual ways. Uh, for example, multiplying two matrices A times B is going to give you a different value than multiplying B times A. That is, they're not commutative in most cases. Now, the cool thing is that matrices and vectors have many, many interpretations in mathematics and engineering, um, and in this case, we can use a vector, a list of numbers, to represent a set of coordinates, which is, after all, just a list of numbers, like 0, 0, and a matrix as a way to transform that coordinate system. If we take measurements and create a table of values uh, using an isometric system, we'll find that the origin is the same in both systems, the Cartesian and the isometric system. 1, 0, however, in the Cartesian system turns into 1, negative 0 0.5 in the isometric system, 0, 1 turns into 1, positive 0 0.5, and 1, 1 turns into 2, 0 in the isometric system. We can come up with a set of expressions that matches this. If we call the coordinates in the isometric projection x prime and y prime, and the coordinates in the Cartesian system x and y, we can create the following expressions. x prime equals x plus y, and y prime equals 0.5y minus 0.5x. 
Furthermore, to reverse these to be in terms of x and y Cartesian coordinates, we get these expressions. x equals 0.5 x prime minus y prime, and y equals y prime plus 0.5 x prime. So, in order to express any pair of coordinates in the Cartesian system and turn them into the isometric system, what we can do is apply the two transformations simultaneously. We can, of course, write out the two simple equations as we just did and solve each of them. But what this actually is, is the application of a transformation matrix that appears like this. Now, if we apply a vector matrix multiplication between the, uh, the coordinate that we're looking at and the transformation matrix, we can produce the isometric coordinates as a function of the Cartesian coordinates or the other way around. Briefly, we take the dot product, uh, the component-wise multiplication of the first row of the matrix and the first column of the vector to get x prime, and we take the second row of the matrix and the first column of the vector dotted together to get y prime. Finally, a couple complications in the programming emerge. I'm just going to give a high-level overview of what I'm doing to manage the isometric system in my game. For a 2D grid, like the game board, we typically would store values in a two-dimensional array. That's at least the simplest version. Um, and we'd have and we'd have to map between the 2D array coordinates and isometric coordinates in order to draw things on the screen in their correct places. For example, if the player is at the position 2, 3 on the grid, we would draw it at 1, 0.5 on the screen and it becomes complicated and confusing to store both systems randomly, so my protocol is just to use standard Cartesian coordinates for pretty much everything, except when we need to display things uh, or get things from the screen. All method inputs are given as Cartesian coordinates, and I provide a couple, a couple of helper functions um, that can be used to transform between isometric and Cartesian. Now, this can, be use, this can be useful in a case where we have an area of effect attack. Uh, in order to get all entities within a distance of 1 from our player, for example, we'd have to draw an oval shape in the isometric uh, system rather than a circle shape, which becomes difficult to define, especially for more complex shapes. If we treat all entities as if they're on a regular grid, we can just draw a circle, which is much simpler to define, find all the objects in that circle, and transform our isometric tiles as necessary. I don't actually think there's any advantage at all programmatically to do business logic on uh, isometric coordinates, and so this, I think, should be minimized in code. Alright, so thanks for watching, and I hope you learned something new about pixel art, linear algebra, or programming in this tutorial. Leave your thoughts and feedback in the comments, and feel free to subscribe and click the bell icon if you want to be notified when I post something new. For a text version of this video, you can check out my website, which I'll have linked in the description, where you'll also find a couple of other links to resources and the software I've used in this video. Finally, check out my Game Jam video, where all of this started. It's become the most popular video by far on my channel, um, and practically doubled the amount of subscribers I've had over a single month. So thanks to all of you who watched that, and for all the helpful feedback. I'll see you next time.